Welcome back to 100 Days of Logic with Carnades.org. We are in the final 10 days of logic looking at predicate calculus. Today we are going to be looking at one of the central and most important concepts in all of logic, the idea of identity. Now it may be a little curious that we're looking at identity only now on the 97th day of logic, but we had to get all the way to relations to understand really what identity is. We're going to represent identity, of course, with a simple, good, old-fashioned equal sign. Now, identity is a relation between two named individuals, but it's a relation that's so important we gave it its own symbol. It would look something like Samuel Clemens is Mark Twain, C equals T, or the morning star is the evening star, M equals E. The important point here is that we're not talking about two things that are different being identical or similar in some qualitative way. We're talking about two names for the same thing. We're not going to get into identity of indiscernibles or indiscernibility of identicals right now. Like I said, there's a lot to go into identity and there's a lot that's going on. In this video, we're going to be focusing on kind of the logical relations and the way to use these concepts of identity in terms of the logic we've been learning about, and specifically in terms of predicate calculus. We're also going to be introducing another symbol that's going to be negated identity. It's something that I may use on and off, but it's definitely something you will see out there. It's the slash through the equal sign. What that means is it's not the case that P is equal to Q. Just so you don't get thrown off by that, examples might be Paris is not London, P does not equal L, or Madonna is not Cher, M does not equal C. There are a lot of things that you can do with identity. You can make a bunch of different statements, and you can make all sorts of new statements that we couldn't make before. Once we have added, next time, modal logic, we will be basically able to make almost any statement in the English language into a logical proposition. This is the first example. Barack Obama is the only president of the United States. So the only is a term or a way of speaking that we haven't learned how to translate into logic speak yet. We now have a way to do it. It would be symbolized as follows. Barack is the president, B is a P, and for all X, X is a P, X is a president, implies that X is identical to B. X is identical to Barack Obama. Therefore, Barack Obama is the only president of the United States. We can also do things like no and accept. No nation except Australia is a continent. What we're saying here is Australia is a nation, and Australia is a continent, and for all X, if X is a nation and X is a continent, that implies that X is identical to Australia. There's no one except. We also have the only, in a more complicated context, the only numbers that divide evenly into a prime number are one and the number itself. This is kind of a definition of what it is to be prime. For all x, x is prime implies that one divides into x, that d is representing a relation between one and x, and x divides evenly into itself, that's dx, x, and for all y, y divides evenly into x implies that either y is identical to x or y is identical to 1. Technically, it's not a perfect definition because 1 would actually fit in this definition, but that's beside the point. It's a pretty close definition, and it is a direct translation of the statement above. All keys have sharps or flats, except C. You can translate this as C is a key, and it's not the case that C has flats, and it's not the case that C has sharps, and for all X, if X is a key, and X is not identical to C, that implies that X either has flats or sharps. That was all except... We can also do superlatives. The blue whale is the largest animal. Blue whale is an animal. And for all x, x is an animal. And x is not a blue whale implies that blue whales are larger than x. 
Pretty cool. Plug in whatever superlative you want and just put the relation in for L. Now, in another video, we learned about properties of relations. Once again, I'll encourage you to check out that video if you're curious. We're going to be referencing a couple things there. So if you get confused in the next couple parts, you should check out that video. Identity, as we said, is a relation. Specifically, it's an equivalence relation, which means that it's a relation that has th properties of reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity. These are going to be the three properties that we end up using for the three rules of inference that we're going to get from identity. All of these rules we're going to call identity and just represent with ID in proofs. Let's take a look. But first, we need to have one more little piece of notation that we're going to add. Script lowercase letters from the beginning of the alphabet are going to be nonspecific individuals, just like our script F was a nonspecific predicate. Script lowercase letters are going to be nonspecific individuals. So the reflexivity part of identity is going to be all things are identical to themselves. A is identical to A. This is a pretty cool rule of inference because you can actually assert this without anything else going on. You can put this out there without any premises, just as you would the beginning of an assumed indirect proof or an assumed conditional proof. This is going to be kind of an axiom of logic. It's one of the reasons I mentioned that identity is one of those things that is really basic to logic, that's really cardinal. It's one of the basic foundations of logic. And this rule of identity is one of those axioms that just exists in logic and we have to accept. So there's not going to be some proof of this. This is just something that people accept on faith, I would say. And one of the reasons we're skeptical of logic, but we'll save that for another video. Now, symmetry is another rule of logic. This is just A equals B implies that B equals A and vice versa. This is a rule of replacement. You can throw it in anywhere. If some A is identical to B, then that B is identical to that A. This is basically like the commutativity rule that we learned about in the original rules of inference, but it's going to be for identity because the only ones we outlined in that one were disjunction and conjunction. Finally, we have transitivity. This is the cool and kind of spooky one. If you have A is an F and A is identical to B, then B is an F as well. If A fulfills some function F and A is identical to B, then B fulfills F. This seems to make sense. If, for example, Mark Twain wrote Huckleberry Finn and Samuel Clemens is identical to Mark Twain, it seems that Samuel Clemens also wrote Huck Finn. However, is going to be a very important stipulation we are going to put on this rule. This only works in extensional contexts, and it's the same caveat we're going to apply to existential generalization. Now, there's a lot I could do to talk about extensional versus intentional contexts. We could explain why that's an S instead of a T in that word. No, I didn't misspell it. There's a whole thing going on. I don't want to get too much into it because this is a video about identity. I'll do a separate video on extensional versus intentional context, but here I'll give you a little bit of a sense of the difference between intentional and extensional context, or at least the reason that we can't use the rule we just learned about in intentional context. So an intentional context would look something like this. Jane knows that Mark Twain was born in Missouri. K, J, M. Mark Twain is Samuel Clemens. M equals S. Jane knows that Samuel Clemens was born in Missouri. And we're just using K, X, Y to represent X knows that Y was born in Missouri. It should be clear this is going to be an invalid argument. Why? Because Jane might not know that Mark Twain is Samuel Clemens. Jane might not even know who Samuel Clemens is is. If we don't have that kind of qualifier of Jane knows on the second statement, we cannot conclude our conclusion that Jane knows that Samuel Clemens was born in Missouri. 
This knowledge statement, statements about knowledge or belief, are going to be intentional contexts because we're not going to be able to substitute co-referencing terms or co-designating descriptions. Salve veritate. Like I said, there's a lot more going on here, and we're not going to get into that right now. Stay tuned for some future videos on philosophy of language where we do. For now, what we're going to do is we're going to show how identity can be used, as opposed to how it can't be used, in a proof. Our proof is going to be S is a P and S is an I, and for all X, X is a P and X is an I implies X is identical to S. Premise 2, C is a P and C is an L. Premise 3, there exists an X such that X is a P and X is an I, and it's not the case that X is an L. And we want to conclude that C is not identical to S. Before I get started on this, I have two challenges for you. The first challenge is just for your edification, or to help you grasp this a little more, maybe. Look at these first three premises and see if you can translate them back into everyday language. There was a specific example that I did get them from, but I want to challenge you to translate them back into everyday language and see what you can do based on the kind of things we learned about the way that identity can be used to represent real statements. Put something in for P, S, L, I, and C, and see what you get. That's challenge number one. Challenge number two is a much more difficult challenge. I've been fighting with this proof, trying to find a way to do it without using either indirect proof or conditional proof. I am, as of yet, unable to do so. It may be impossible to do so, but if you are able to do so using only the rules of inference we've learned so far, find a way to go from these three premises to this conclusion without using either indirect or conditional proof. I will feature it in a future video. I will give you a shout out on my channel because that is awesome. With that out of the way, let's get started on this proof. As I said, we can't do it without conditional or indirect proof. At least I haven't found a way, but it shouldn't be too hard if we use indirect proof. First thing we're going to do is assume the opposite of the conclusion. If you don't know why I'm using indirect proof here, the reason is we have a negated conclusion that's pretty short, and there's no clear first step for us to really take with those three premises other than simplifying a bunch of stuff and then not really knowing what to do. So, the most obvious choice is to assume the opposite of the conclusion and try to find a contradiction. We'll draw our line going down. Then, remembering we should do existential instantiation before we do other things, we will existentially instantiate premise 3 to get A is a P and A is an I, and it's not the case that A is an L, premise 3 existential instantiation. Premise 6, for all X, X is a P and X is an I implies X is identical to S. That's just premise 1 simplification, we've kind of gotten rid of those first two terms there. Premise 7, a is a P, and A is an I implies A is an S. That's premise 6, universal instantiation. We're allowed to instantiate into that A because it's universal instantiation. We're going from an all, not an existential statement. We can simplify premise 5 down to A is a P, and A is an I. Then just use modus ponens on 7 and 8 to get A is identical to S. Next up, we will simplify premise 5 up there to get it's not the case that A is an L, or it's not the case that L A. And then we will use our rule of identity, ooh, fancy, to go from premises 9 and 10 to get it's not the case that S is an L, because if A is identical to S and A is not an L, then S is not an L. Then we're going to go and take premise 2, simplify it down to C is an L, and once again use our law of identity because C is identical to S according to premise 4, and C is an L, therefore S is an L. However, this of course leaves us with a contradiction. S is an L, and it's not the case that S is an L. Premise 11, premise 13, conjunction. Finding a contradiction, we can go ahead and conclude that our original assumption was not the case. It's not the case that C is identical to S from premises 4 through 14, indirect proof. And as we've learned in this video, that's just going to be identical to our conclusion of C is not equal 
to S, or C is not identical to S. There's a lot you can do with identity. With this, we have almost all of the rules of logic that we're going to learn. We're going to learn a little bit more in the next video on possibility and necessity and how those are worked into logic. But that's a little bit more complicated and not something you'll see if you're not dealing with modal logic. With these tools and these understandings, you should be able to do most all of logic. That was identity. Next up is modal logic. Ooh. Then we will do some final logic problems and answers using all of the rules we've learned so far. Watch this video and more at carnades.org. And stay skeptical, everybody.